All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to season two of SageMaker Fridays. My name is Julian, and I'm a principal developer advocate focusing on AI and machine learning. Before we explain what SageMaker Fridays are about, please meet my co-presenter. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Segelen, and I'm a senior data scientist working with uh, AWS Machine Learning Solution Lab. Um, my role is to help customers to get their ML projects on the right track uh, in order to create business value um, as fast as possible. All right, so um, we're in the same room, actually, but we have two different cameras, so <laughs> don't get confused. Uh, we're live from the Paris office. So, in a way, today it's uh, French machine learning cuisine, right? Hopefully, it's going to be tasty. And uh, it's really cool to have you on board because we're going to need your expertise. So, let's quickly explain what SageMaker Fridays are about. So, every week from today until November 13th, so six episodes, we will discuss a real life use case for machine learning and uh, we'll see how it can be solved using a service called Amazon SageMaker, which was launched almost three years ago now. And as you can imagine, SageMaker is a fully managed service for machine learning. All episodes are 100% slide free uh, because uh, we know you want to see some code and that's what you're going to get, lots of code. So I hope that's all right. And uh, in addition, all episodes are live, like I said. And uh, feel free to ask all your questions in the, in the chat. We have a team of uh, machine learning specialists that uh, are helping us answer the questions. So thank you er um, very much for helping us, guys. We really, really appreciate it. And by the way, there are no silly questions. So please don't be shy and uh, ask all your questions, learn as much as possible. We're really here to help you understand more about ML, AWS, and SageMaker. So all questions welcome. Please use the opportunity. Okay, so it's time to get started. So Sogolen, what is this episode about? So uh, in this episode, uh, we are going to talk about uh, predictive maintenance, uh, which mm. deal with predicting, predicting when a piece of equipment will fail. Yeah. Um, by predicting failure well in advance, a uh, maintenance team can fix or replace the equipment and avoid uh, unplayed uh, outage and downtime. Oh, that's that's nice. <laughs> I really like that topic. I wish my dishwasher could do that. Um, you know, those things break down at the worst possible time and then you're stuck <laughs> until you get a new one and you have to do the dishes uh, manually, So, which I don't really enjoy. So it would be nice to get advance warning, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's exactly the point, Julian. And uh, but today we are not going to work uh, with your data from your dishwasher. Uh, Sorry okay. about that. <laughs> we are going to use uh, NASA oh, TurboFan okay. Engine datasets, uh, which contain time series data uh, representing sensor information coming from aircraft engines. Okay. So, uh, with this dataset, we are going to train a deep learning model based on CNN bidirectional LSTM architecture wow. on SageMaker okay. in order to predict uh, the remaining useful life of an engine. Okay, that sounds amazing. And yes, it sounds more uh, sophisticated than dishwashers. <laughs> so that's a lot of uh, machine learning in one sentence. Uh, CNN bidirectional LSTM architecture. So grab a cup of coffee or one more cup of coffee. Uh, it looks like we're going to learn a lot about SageMaker and deep learning today. Uh, so by the way, all the material that we're going to use is online. We're using a GitHub repository, and uh, I will I will share the URL later on, um, and so that you can replay uh, exactly what we're doing today. Okay, so you can easily clone the repo and get to work. And there's also a CloudFormation template. CloudFormation is our infrastructure as code service, and it builds all the resources that you need. Um, and uh, that includes a Lambda function that we could use for automation, but we'll talk about automation later in the, in the show, okay? So before we dive into the code, uh, let's take a few minutes to discuss the machine learning problem itself and how we're going to solve it. Let's literally start from you know, the first step, which is, what is it we're trying to solve 
and what data do we need? Why we, would we use the, the algo that we're using today? Okay, which is really um, what a machine learning team would do, right? Yes. Uh, analyze the business problem and try to figure out where to go next. So let's start with a very simple question. So what's the problem we're really trying to solve from a data perspective? So when we talk about uh, predictive maintenance, actually, it's a big one. Uh, because what you want to do is you want to look into the future. Mm. Uh, in French, we have a proverb that says <laughs> <laughs> it is better to anticipate than to cure. Okay. And uh, I think this is really the goal of uh, the session of today, because in any kind of uh, manufacture, the downtime uh, can be super expensive, especially mm. because of the domino effect. And okay. uh, people look for solutions to forecast the state of uh, their equipment in the coming minutes, mm. hours, or days. Okay. And if you can model it, so you can take the good decision at the good moment, uh, avoided, uh, avoiding sorry, uh, disastrous consequences due to an ex unexpected downtime. Okay. Uh, so it is really a real management uh, problem. Okay, interesting, and I think we we um, we can give you a, a real life example. Um, so we we have a customer called uh, Veolia Water Technologies, mm -hmm. and they're the, the global leader in in water processing, and uh, and they actually used machine learning and SageMaker to uh, predict when they should uh, change water filters mm -hmm. in water processing plants. And um, it's a really, really cool uh, example of uh, predictive maintenance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When do you need to replace the equipment? And uh, th they have a, a very good video explaining this, uh, this project. And uh, I, again, I will share the, that URL with you at the end of the session. But so, yeah, predictive maintenance is... Uh, I would say a common problem in, in industry. Yeah, and a very important problem because, again, it's very expensive, but you don't expect a failure. It can cost you a lot of money, mm. so it's better. Yeah, and if you replace equipment too soon, too then soon, it costs yeah, too money exactly. as well. So you have so to find the right balance. The right yeah? balance, okay. exactly. All right. So I guess my next question is, uh, why should we even use machine learning for this? I know machine learning is exciting and and, uh, and we all want to learn more about it. But at the same time, oh, why can't we use traditional statistical techniques, right? We can do forecasting with traditional techniques. So why why not? Good luck <laughs> if you're trying to do an ARIMA model. No, the idea is, have you ever uh, opened a log from uh, a file containing log from a machine? Uh, no. <laughs> no so, <laughs> My dishwasher doesn't log anything, sorry. <laughs> so, sorry but, yes, you're right. But uh, no, actually, when you open um, a file from, uh, containing some logs from sensor or something like that, you're going to see it's a big file, uh, sometimes very messy, mm. and traditional statistic uh, model honestly cannot deal with such an amount of data. Okay. So you really need, and this is the reason why uh, we can use, uh, we need to use a deep learning model, is in order to uh, be able to ingest all the data okay. generated sure. by the equipment, sure. and, uh, especially if you are at a very fine-grained uh, resolution, maybe at, at the second or something like that, mm. uh, you, uh, okay. some traditional model can watch okay makes sense and also uh, i would think um uh, predictive maintenance includes sensors a uh, data coming from many sensors right yeah, exactly. so you have multi-variate multi time series not just one thing uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 no it's not a, it's not uh univariate it's not a mm, univariate okay. product you've got multi-variate time series so a lot of time series and you need to be able to combine in one in uh, okay one find the patterns between exactly. those series between, yeah. okay so deep learning all the way then yeah. yes <laughs> uh so you mentioned data sets can be very uh, complicated uh, for those problems so what what kind of data do we even need here so from my experience, and when you start um, a predictive, a predictive maintenance project, um, you will have to look first for some data generated uh, by the equipment of interest, mm -hmm. and most of the time from uh, data from sensor. But again, 
uh, when you when you do when you do some productive nine months projects, um, take your time and grab extra coffee because uh, it's gonna take a lot of time and you're gonna spend a lot of time on gathering, uh, denoising, storing mm. your data, and especially understanding your data. Yeah, data cleaning is. Uh, is typically 80 percent oh, of a project God. but for time series it, it sounds like it's 90 uh, yeah, it's even more yeah even more, okay exactly. all right so we'll look at uh, fortunately we have a very friendly data set today and yeah. it's uh, it's ready to go okay so we we said deep learning is uh, is probably a, a, an interesting solution to deal with the, the volume of data and deal with the multivariate time series so what kind of algo uh, could we consider using here so, um, if you want to understand well uh, predictive maintenance, uh, you need to see it as a kind of uh, survival analysis, uh, which is a branch of statistics for uh, quantifying the time it takes for an event of interest to occur, uh, in our case, uh, the machine failure, and um, time is really the core aspect of predictive maintenance. So uh, you need to use a dynamic algorithm which allows you uh, to model not only single data points, mm -hmm. uh, but also an, an entire sequence of data uh, in order to be able to say, uh, I know my state at t minus three, my state at t minus, t minus two, my state at t minus one. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can say, uh, I can say, predict uh, what's going to happen uh, in T0 and T plus 1. And this is the reason why we already talk about uh, predictive uh, maintenance, a kind okay. of prediction. And so it looks like we're going to, we're going to use recurring networks, yes? Ah, <laughs> let's see. Let's see, let's see. Okay, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So anyway, uh, I think experience and intuition are important. Right? Yeah. Deep learning is crazy complicated and you can build an infinite combination of, uh, of layers and models. Uh -huh. uh, but you know, you work with those topics all the time. So naturally, you know, you, you know what kind of algo is going to work well. Yeah, yeah, but after it's again as a starting point. as a starting point, yeah, and again try a baseline. It's at the beginning, maybe a quite simple uh, deep learning algorithm, and after if you want to add good, good complexity, uh, mm -hmm. modify. Yeah. But again, the yeah, start simple, start yeah. small is but, always yeah, good yeah, advice. Yeah, 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 especially with deep learning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that we understand the problem, uh, let's talk about the data set we're going to use today. Um, so tell us a little bit about our data set. Um, so today, so no, when you uh, when you start a predictive uh, maintenance project, you use, uh, as we already mentioned, some uh, data from a sensor network. Mm -hmm. They can be embedded within an IT uh, IoT environment. Uh, but today we are going to use uh, some time series uh, which come from a NASA software named the CMAX. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a software for system simulation, and it means that uh, commercial, modular, aero, propulsion, system, simulation. <laughs> I think it's like right. the data come from nice. this. <laughs> and it's like an open source uh, data set. And the idea is that you're going to play uh, with these data, which are similar to the real world ones. Mm. And after you can test uh, the performance of your algorithm on a validated and verify a quite generic engine model. Mm. Again, training and testing, you know. Okay. So yeah, very, very cool uh, data set that um, simulate the behavior yeah, of exactly. um, um, basically um, aircraft engines. Um, so it's it's a it's a very clean data set, right? Uh, it's it's uh, we won't be running any almost any pre-processing on this. But uh, again, in real life, what are the steps that you would typically take? Um, again, it's like a lot of time uh, because you need to uh, clean your data, trying to denoise them because most of the time, especially when you use data from sensor, uh, you're going to have a lot of noise into your data. So you need to understand and to see uh, what, what, what the noise is and how to remove it. And uh, again, the raw data quality from sensor uh, can, be super, uh, can be super bad and you need to make your own dirty uh, 
when you're cleaning. And uh, yes, it's uh, but here uh, during the, um, the the data set we are going to use today is already clean and aligned, and we're just gonna uh, normalize uh, mm -hmm. the columns. Okay, simple. Yes, yeah, simple, simple operations. Yeah, simple operation today. Yeah. Okay, so um, maybe let's take a look at the data set. So let me switch um, to this, uh, this the other display and give me a second here. Share screen, yes. Okay. All right, so here come the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's, uh, let's explain a little bit what we have. So again, it's that NASA data set called CMAPS. And it, it comes actually in four parts, right? Mm -hmm. So we have four, uh, we have data for four different engines. Mm -hmm. So four files, right? Uh, which uh, which are numbered one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. right? So we have a training set and uh, we have a test set as well. So here we see data for engine one, right? And um, what are those columns? So the first number here, is um, what is called the trajectory, mm -hmm. okay? So in fact, we can see, scroll a little bit. Uh, we have multiple trajectories. Uh, I think we have a, a 100 in this data set. And this one, yeah. yes, this I one. I think it's 100. And so each trajectory is basically a run, a full run for the engine, right? So simulating, you know, I guess, takeoff and flying up and, and, then, uh, and then flying level and then, landing right so we have a number of runs and for each trajectory we have uh cycles mm -hmm. yeah that's the second number here you can see one two three four five six etc all the way to the end of the trajectory and this is basically a, um, a, a, a moment in time yeah. where we capture data mm -hmm. correct and then we see sensor data so we have i think 25 uh 25 individual values so if i remember when the column number two three and four are like uh, operational six oh, okay so yes you're right and after this the, the sensor you're right yeah so yeah i think exactly you're right so the first yeah maybe the first two or three are actually not sensors uh there are settings and and the rest is sensors and these are the time series right yeah, exactly yeah okay so these are the uh, i think we have 20 yeah 26 actually 26 sensors and uh, and we can see the time series, cycle after cycle. Okay, so that's the the sensor data mm -hmm. we're talking about. So that's what we have, and then of course uh, we want to predict the next failure, mm -hmm. and this is what they call the real um, the remaining useful life RUL, and it is also part of the data set. Okay, so we have. 100 values okay so at the beginning of trajectory one rul is 112 cycles um at the at the beginning of trajectory two remaining useful life is 98 etc okay so that's the that's ground truth right mm -hmm. and that's what we're going to use to learn okay so that's what the data set looks like and we have a test set which looks like uh which looks like the uh, the training set. Okay, so hopefully that's clear, right? So um, we have a different files. We're just going to use this file for, for training today. We have 100 tra trajectories, which represent full runs for that, that engine. Each trajectory is uh, a, a series of steps mm -hmm. that are called cycles, and each cycle is capturing 26 sensors. And of course, those 26 uh sensors over time right build our time series mm -hmm. okay and we're trying to predict that rul value mm -hmm. okay so hopefully this is clear okay um and it's not a big data set right no uh it's it's that which is why it's it's a uh, probably a good uh, a good uh, uh it's clean and not too big so yeah. it's easy to work with right yeah exactly I think total it's about 45 megabytes and, and you can download it easily. Um, so a question I get a lot is how much data do I need? Right. So how do we know? Of course we'll trust the, we'll trust NASA, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hi NASA, we trust you. Uh, who are we to to challenge you? Uh, but uh, joking aside, how do we know it's enough data? 
So I would say that it really depends about uh, on the machine you are going to um, to study and where you want to predict. But uh, the idea is at least you need to have enough data uh, to have um, some different full cycles uh, to be able to um, to capture mm. uh, the potential seasonality, the okay. potential, etc. So, so um, in, especially with deep learning model, you need to have some data in order to be able to sure. um, to, uh, to capture and to extract some patterns. So uh, don't be shy and don't be, uh, yeah, take some data and okay. go ahead, yeah. Okay, so let's see. Let's see what kind of results. Yeah. Again, like I said, it's not it's not huge uh, by by any any means, but okay, let's see what, what kind of accuracy we get here. Okay, all right, so we understand the data a little bit more. Um, now let's talk about the algo. So say go, uh, let me, and let me switch to, to the code because of course we're gonna look at the code. Um, so first, before we dive into the code and go crazy here, <laughs> what are we looking at here? What are we using uh, to train this model? So uh, as we already said, um, the notion of time and of dynamic sequence, again, you remember that mm -hmm. uh, 3 t minus 2 t minus 1 is really at the earth of uh, predictive maintenance. So uh, this solution we are going to present you today, uh, leverage a custom stack, uh, long short term uh, memory mo neural network model. Mm -hmm. So in a quick, to, to say it quickly, uh, an LSTM model. Okay. So as you said, from the RNN uh, big family, uh, which uh, allows you uh, through a memory cell uh, to capture and store uh, the long-term dependency uh, in your time series. Mm -hmm. And if I want to be more precise, yes, uh, please. <laughs> yes, we use a convolutional bidirectional LSTM model. So okay. what does it mean? It means that you're going to use a convolution um, the convolution of CNN, mm -hmm. you know. So, so, so yeah, let me show you the model. Yeah. The math property, so the convolution, which gonna help you, when help us uh, to identify patterns um, in our time series. So the convolution uh, will act like an information filter. Mm -hmm. And after the LSTM part uh, in the code, uh, will help will help us uh, capture the temporal evolution of this pattern. So okay. two side CNN LSTM. So yeah, pattern extraction, trying to figure out dependencies uh, within time series and between time series. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and then using uh, LSTM to find the time element yeah, in exactly. there, right? The okay. The temporal, the, the temporal thing. So here's the model and, uh, you know, it. Uh, it's pretty obvious which library we're using here. So we're using <laughs> uh, Gluon. Uh, Gluon is an API which is part of Apache MXNet. Apache MXNet is a popular library for deep learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, and Gluon is, an, um, a, let's say, a high level API on top of MXNet. Which uh, which is very flexible and great for experimentation. <laughs> and don't worry if you don't know uh, MXNet or Gluon. We're going to uh, we're going to focus on the architecture and we're going to explain the, the rationale. So the the individual parameters don't mean uh, they don't matter much for for this discussion. Okay, so we'll, we're we're going to look at the code, but let's explain what the algo looks like. So. Um, this is the model, and we can use the built-in uh, the built-in layers available in uh, in Gluon. So first, um, we run a, a lambda function, uh, which is just used to put data columns in the right order. Mm -hmm. So um, the shape of the data here is uh, the, so the the batch size, mm -hmm. and by default we use one. So the first dimension of the input tensor is going to be one. Um, the second dimension is the number of cycles. We saw that, right, in the data. Let me show you again. The number of cycles, that second column, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera, for that trajectory, mm -hmm. okay? And, oops, let me go to the code. Okay, so that's the second dimension of the input tensor. And the third dimension is, of course, the number of time series, mm -hmm. okay, which is the 25, I think. OK, so the, the, this looks like a really weird line of code, uh, but the only thing that it does is it just uh, swaps mm -hmm. uh, dimension uh, one with dimension two. two. 
okay and so we so now the shape of the tensor is batch size so one and then 25 number of time series and then the number of cycles and the reason why we do this is because in the next layer we use convolution and convolution is actually performed on the last dimension of the tensor mm -hmm. okay so we're just we're just pointing the convolution layer at the right uh, <laughs> dimension which is really um, the the uh, the, the data points for, for the cycle, okay? So then we run convolution, okay? So convolution is well known for images. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, uh, but when we use images, we use 2D convolution, mm -hmm. which means the convolution filter is the, yeah. is, is, uh, is square, right? It's two dimensions. Mm -hmm. So here we use a one-dimensional um, filter, or actually we use 32, a one-dimensional kernel, and we have 32 channels. Okay, so these will be parameters that are learned. Mm -hmm. We're trying to figure out, you know, what the patterns are in there. And then, so the output for this will be uh, still, you know, uh, a, 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 a tensor of shape one, because the batch size is one, 25, because we still have 25 time series, and then a number of uh, convoluted features, mm -hmm. right? Which, of course, is of variable length because we have a variable number of cycles. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we do it again, right? So we try to extract, <laughs> <laughs> extract some more. Okay, so again, the shape of data here is, will be 125 and something variable length. Then we transpose it back, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we put it in, the, in back in the original order, so batch size, uh, um, a number of cycles, 25, and then we run LSTM. Okay, so tell us a little bit about that LSTM layers. We see lots of parameters here. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, about that. So yeah, it's, uh, so the, the, during the, so yeah. thanks to Guion, so you need just to um, to uh, put the parameters you want, so the number of units, uh, the number of layers you want uh, in your uh, NLCM, if you want it to be directional or, um, or not. And uh, the idea is first you try with maybe the default parameter of some basic one, and after mm -hmm. uh, you can um, iterate uh, to see if you, when you modify uh, some parameters, uh, you've got some improvement of the metric of your and the performance of your uh, algorithm. So we'll look at those values because the next question I get the most is how do I size my layers, how many neurons, etc. And the, the ugly secret is no one really knows, exactly. but <laughs> at least we're honest. Uh, no one really knows what the values are, and there's an easy way to figure this out. But I'll be talking about that in a second. Uh, and so the final layer is a dense layer, so uh, a fully connected layer that just reduces the output of the LSTM into a single value, which mm -hmm. is that RUL UL. fellow, right? The remain useful. Okay. Like all right, so there you go. Even if you don't know Gluon, you get you get an idea what we're doing. Convoluting twice to uh, to extract patterns, and then send that uh, time series tensor into an LSTM to find the time element in there and let LSTM do its magic, and then reduce the output to the RUL. Okay, and you can see how Gluon makes it very compact, right? To mm -hmm. define yeah, exactly. even a slightly complicated model already. Okay, so let's talk about hyperparameters, right? Because we see some, again, we see some things here being parameters. So let me go up in the script. And these are the hyperparameters. Okay, so some of them are uh, linked to SageMaker. Uh, we, we haven't talked about SageMaker much yet, but SageMaker will automatically pass the location of the training set and the location where to save the train model. Okay, this is called script mode. Mm -hmm. SageMaker, and it's how you run um, framework code on SageMaker. So if you have scikit-learn code or TensorFlow code or PyTorch code, MXNet code, you just need to integrate that code using uh, here environment variables that are passed by SageMaker, and you can very easily run um, uh, your code on SageMaker. So adapting code for SageMaker is you know, really, really simple. I mean, I can do it, so anyone can, <laughs> right? Script mode is what you need to look for. Now, if we look at 
um, maybe architecture parameters. So of course we see batch size and epochs and learning rate, etc. But okay, we see those two things here: number of layers, number of units, and these are the default values, right? Mm -hmm. So one unit, one layer. So simple, right? <laughs> a very small <laughs> LSTM. Um, so let's see if we end up using those. And uh, of course, the, the main question is what 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 parameters would give us the best result? Mm -hmm. And again, the answer is no one really knows, but you could use uh, one of SageMaker features called automatic model tuning to automatically explore hyperparameter ranges. So you could launch mm -hmm. some, some uh, tuning job and say, okay, try maybe one, two, three layers with uh, from one to 16 units, mm -hmm. go figure it out, right? And run 10 jobs, right? And automatic model tuning would do that and uh, and uh, and quickly find the, the optimal combination, mm -hmm. okay? So we're not gonna do it today um, in the interest of time, but uh, generally automatic model tuning is a super useful feature. And, uh, and I highly recommend that you use it even for architecture search like this. Exactly. Okay. Well, I think uh, we're almost uh, ready to run this. What else could we talk? Uh, yeah, I'll talk about. So maybe we can take a quick look. Uh, so data loading is not too complicated. Uh, the loss function, maybe you can. Uh, so what loss function are we using here? The RMSC many to one. So again, uh, the idea of time series when you do some time series and prediction, you're going to compare, uh, yes, compare mm -hmm. the predicted uh, versus the actual value. And uh, one metric uh, you can use in order to compare predicted versus actual is like the RMSC. So okay. um, RMSC root mean root mean square error, and it's like uh, yeah, which yeah, basically it's a pre it's a regression problem, right? Yeah, Trying exactly. to predict that. Exactly. Uh, that unique value, so RMSC, root mean square error is a, is a good one. Okay, so we looked at the model and okay, the training loop I would say is, looks quite standard to me. Uh, so iterating over epochs, getting the, net, getting the next batch of data, um, reading the data itself, reading the label, uh, recording the, the gradients automatically, uh, forwarding, so that's uh, forward propagation, right? Propagating data through the model, reading predictions, applying the loss function, and then backward prop, and then stepping through, um, uh, going through the next step, and that's about it, right? So uh, it's uh, it's very typical for yeah, exactly uh, for a deep learning training job here. Okay, and of course, at the end, we save the model in the location that SageMaker pointed us to. Okay, and saving is just saving the parameters. And yeah, the main function for this is, of course, load the data, um, instantiate the model. Uh, hybridization is interesting. So uh, let, let me say a word about that if, you, if I can. So um, um, Gluon is a very dynamic library um, and it's great for experimentation, but sometimes it comes at the cost of performance, mm -hmm. right? Because we keep the execution graph um, uh, the way we define it. So uh, hybridization is a way to optimize that code. And, uh, you know, so using uh, um, uh, optimization on, on speed and, and, and memory allocation, et cetera. So uh, that helps us get close to the performance mm -mm. of a fully uh, of a fully static uh, library like you know tensorflow mm -hmm. or even uh, I would say mxnet uh, uh, vanilla mxnet mm -hmm. without using glue on so uh, yeah that's basically an optimization step uh, then we apply learning rates etc uh, etc et and we train right and when it comes to predicting um, we have a function to load the model. Uh, which is uh, quite simple, and and then predicting is just again you know forwarding data. There's nothing nothing really fancy here, right? And reading the output. Okay, okay. So enough uh, enough glue on. I think we kind of understand what this thing is doing. Um, we'll be using batch prediction anyway, right? Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Any reason why batch prediction is a good fit for predictive maintenance? 
Um, no, it's quite uh, typical to use batch prediction, so it's a good practice uh, in this area. So uh, usually we pull data from machines and exactly, and after yeah. you see what's up. Yeah, it's not a real, it's not really a real time no. process. No, I mean, no. it could be, right? It could be. So it's uh, it's depend after the uh, yeah. if the, the machine is very curious at what part is it in the supply chain mm -hmm. or something like that. But, okay. no, yeah. but yeah, we're going to use batch. Okay, so now it's time to actually put everything together. Mm -hmm. Right, and start running this code, training the model, and use SageMaker. So um, I am using here SageMaker Studio. Yeah, yeah that's what it says here. <laughs> uh, so SageMaker Studio is our uh, machine learning IDE. Mm -hmm. Was launched at reInvent uh, just about a year ago. That's right. Uh, um, and where do you where do you find it? Well, you can just go to the AWS console. And uh, so SageMaker is available in plenty of regions across the world, and uh, Studio is available in uh, a smaller number of regions. Um, available in a couple of uh, American regions and uh, a couple of European regions, etc. So uh, I'm using the Ireland region here, EU West 1. And so if you are in a supported region, you just click on this link. Uh, obviously, my account is already set up, but uh, creating um, uh, your uh, user for SageMaker Studio literally takes 30 seconds. You have a simple wizard, just mm. click, click, click. Uh, you know, it's uh, very easy to do. And then you just click on Open Studio and you will jump into something that looks like this. Okay, so Studio is, uh, again, a web-based IDE. It's based on Jupyter Lab, so it's going to look and feel extremely familiar. Um, and, and we also added a number of uh, integrations with some of SageMaker's capabilities. So really quickly so we have SageMaker experiments here experiments is a way to manage and compare all the jobs associated with your experiments um, uh, processing jobs mm -hmm. training jobs uh, um, batch transform jobs etc and you can track everything nicely here so this is uh, what this uh, little flask means and um, and you can also create an experiment. We're not going to go through the whole story here, but what this really means is you can actually launch a SageMaker autopilot job, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and autopilot is an AutoML capability that lets you build um, regression and uh, classification models from uh, tabular data. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is really a, a no-code experience, right? <laughs> which is uh, which is great. You can just click and get your model yeah, exactly. on the way, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and there are a few more things like this. Uh, you know, you can see endpoints, SageMaker endpoints, which are HTTPS prediction APIs based on your models, etc. So that's all the nice goodies in Studio. Right, all the all those nice integrations with um, existing SageMaker capabilities. Okay, okay. So now it's time to look at this notebook. Okay, and again, um, this is available in a repo. Let me show you if you want to follow along. Um, it's the AWS Labs Predictive Maintenance Using Machine Learning. Right, which is exactly what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> So it's a good name for it. Well done. <laughs> and uh, if you go to source notebooks, you'll find that notebook, right? Okay. So I'll wait for a few seconds if you want to type that name, predictive maintenance using okay. machine learning. Okay. And you can follow along. And of course, you can clone it and, and run it. Okay. So first of all, we install the SageMaker SDK, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the Python SDK that drives all the, the uh, training deployment activity. Uh, if you've been using SageMaker before, I uh, just want to mention we had a major SDK release in the summer, in late, uh, early August, actually. Okay, so SDK 2.x, uh, which, which has a few breaking changes, but nothing really bad, right? So uh, you, you shouldn't have much problem um, uh, migrating your notebooks from uh, V1 to V2. Okay, I'm using V2 here, of course. Um, then there's a basic setup script uh, to uh, to import some of the local uh, libraries that are part of the repo. Okay, uh, and then we, of course, import the SageMaker SDK. So I'm using version 2.14. 
which I think is the latest. It was the latest yesterday. So <laughs> hopefully it's not 2.21 this morning. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Um, okay, and then we have some explanation here, but we already uh, covered that. Okay. Um, so here we're grabbing the data set mm -hmm. from S3. Okay, so we use the AWS command line to copy it uh, to Studio. We extract it. Okay, and then we apply pre-processing. And as you mentioned, this is really normalization. Yeah, and yeah. you can see it it's, uh, in the pre-processed data file uh, in the GitHub. You're gonna see we just normalize. Um, the columns of the data set. Mm. Again, what it is for is just to be able to compare and to study time series on the a, on a, on a same scale. Is that yeah, true? because one sensor could be yeah. uh, recording values between 0 and 1,000, exactly. and another sensor could be between uh, minus 10 and plus 10. Or... Exactly, and okay. so you want to have the same scale mm. uh, in order to, yeah, to compare what it is okay. comparable. <laughs> exactly. So that's what that's what this thing does, and we can plot some values, right? So these are some some normalized values from uh, from uh, uh, one uh, trajectory. Okay. And maybe here we can say sure. that uh, it is important too to have a good visualization of the sensor and the, that before doing any kind of deep learning model. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, we can see that, for instance, the sensor number five, um, the value are uh, the same. Flat, yeah. A flat mm. uh, during all the during all the the recording. The trajectory, yes. Yeah. So maybe at one moment you will uh, drop, uh, for instance, the sensor five. So it's very important to have an idea of the behavior. Yeah, explore of exploratory it's, analysis. So here, yeah, we just, yeah, it's a good point. If you have the the same value over the whole thing, either the sensor is broken yeah. or. Or, or something's not right, or maybe it is just, it's more of a setting than a, than a time series then, right? So it's important to visualize yeah. your data again. To, uh, okay, uh, yeah, we could probably remove those and, and yeah. have good results. Okay, all right. And we can see something is going up here. Yeah, maybe it's engine <laughs> temperature or vibration, or and then it, it breaks. And it's a good thing I'm not. Yeah, yeah. the risk. Maybe it's the risk of your thermal fan. <laughs> yeah. I'll never, I'll never feel safe on the plane now. Maybe okay. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't say that. Okay, um, it's bad luck. All right. So here's the data, and now we need to put the data in S3. Mm -hmm. Okay, because that's where SageMaker expects the data, mm -hmm. right? It needs to be in S3. Although, although you have a couple of other storage options uh, for uh, for SageMaker, you can store your data in Amazon EFS. Amazon EFS is our NFS compatible uh, uh, storage service. So. If you're an NFS uh, kind of shop, or if your workflows, you know, need uh, filer and filers and, and file sharing, etc., then you could use EFS. And for performance, it, it could also be an interesting option. And for pretty extreme use cases um, related to high performance computing, if you need a lot of I/O and a lot of throughput on potentially, you know, very large training jobs. Uh, involving hundreds of instances, you can use Amazon FSx for Luster, which, as the name implies, is a managed service based on the Luster high performance file system. Um, but honestly, I would only reserve this for the most extreme uh, workloads. Okay, so S3, uh, we have 14 megabytes here, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we can stick to S3. Okay, <laughs> so basically, what we do is uh, we take the data that was normalized, the, the test set, the train set, and we upload that to an S3 bucket, okay? And we can see the location here, all right? And so if we display that data, just to understand what we're really doing, we can see pretty much what we saw on the graph, mm -hmm. yeah? Uh, so we see the ID for the trajectory, and we can see we have 100 trajectories in the training set. We can see the cycles for each individual trajectory. We can see all the normalized sensor values mm -hmm. and settings. And one thing the pre-processing script does is also compute that RUL. Um, okay, so, so it starts interest, exactly. Yeah. So it starts from the, that ground truth value that we see here, and uh, and then it computes 
uh, it computes the actual value at each cycle. So at the beginning of trajectory one, RUL is 191. After one cycle, it's 190. After two cycles, it's 189, etc. And it, of course, it goes all the way to zero, as we can see. Yeah, for the last trajectory, uh, this is where the engine fails. And the idea again, when you do like the deep deep learning model, so you can see you've got a lot of uh, value for the sensors. You've got maybe mm. 20 columns or something like that. And the idea is you, you really want to see the link between all these. And this is really why the deep learning model uh, is important, is that you've got plenty of multivariate time series, mm. and after one variable of interest, and you want to see. Yeah, this. yeah. Again, yes, you could you could find you know you could find interesting information within one time series, yeah, exactly. right? So you could say if I go back here, okay, let's say this is engine vibration, mm -hmm. or well, okay, this is clearly going up, and something nasty happens here, <laughs> right? Yeah. But it, it's probably more complex than this, and there, there's maybe a correlation. Maybe you could say, okay, S2, S3, S4 have something in common here yeah. as well, right? So if S2 is going up, but the others are not going up, you're fine. If all three are going up, you know, you just lost, <laughs> maybe you lost three engines, okay? Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's really, really bad, or maybe you lost three different parts of the engine <laughs> because it's the same engine. Anyway, um, all right. Okay, so that's what we're looking at. So we have data in S3. We'll store uh, all uh, training artifacts, the model in S3 as well. Okay, so this is the training script. This is the gluon script we looked at. Okay, so let me skip that bit. We already saw this with uh, that uh, convolution and uh, LSTM combination. And now we get to the point where we train. Okay. So this is my favorite part in SageMaker because it's really one line of code, yeah, right? Exactly. So we use, in this case, the MXNet estimator. Um, and we pass it the location of our training script, which is local to uh, SageMaker Studio. And we ask for one training instance uh, of uh, a P3 to Excel. It's a GPU instance, mm -hmm. okay? Because we're running deep learning and GPUs are a good way to accelerate that. And by the way, this is the only infrastructure work you need to do, right? Mm, exactly. Yeah? exactly. And after what it, maybe it is important to mention is that depending the, the workload and the training you, want, you have, you've got different type of instance. So exactly. Yeah, we take the P3, but after, depending if you've got a big, um, big data set, uh, maybe you need to change your training, uh, your instance, etc. So yeah, if we wanted. So this one has one GPU. So we could use, uh, an inst if we needed eight GPUs, uh, we could just use P316XL, which has eight GPUs. And <laughs> automatically, MXNet would leverage mm -mm. Uh, those GPUs. And we could say, oh, hey, you've got eight GPUs to play with. So go <laughs> and do it. Yeah. Come and do it. No. Yeah, we don't really need this, right? No, no, we don't need it. Uh, and of course, yes, as you mentioned, we have a, a very wide selection of um, uh, of instances, CPU-based, GPU-based. So you can find all the specs and pricing online. And um, yeah, zero infrastructure work, which is great. And by the way, uh, you know, we don't, we're talking about pricing. You know, we want to spend as little as possible. So I added uh, those three lines that enable spot instances. Yeah, that's great. So spot instances are a way to use unused capacity in uh, uh, unused compute capacity in AWS at a very deep discount. So let's see how much we say. I know the number, but I'm, I'm not gonna <laughs> I'm not gonna tell you now. Okay. So just use spot instances, uh, and we have some hyperparameters. So you know, I um, uh, I looked in my crystal ball. <laughs> And my crystal ball told me use eight LSTM units and two layers <laughs> and 200 epochs and the ADAM optimizer. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Well, I have a very powerful yeah, crystal, just, box. crystal <laughs> box. <laughs> <laughs> Again, um, you know, don't trust me. Um, uh, this is just manual experimentation. Um, I have no idea. You know, I really don't know that these are interesting values. <laughs> uh, they seem to work. We see RMAC going down, mm -hmm. but are they, are they the best? No. And so again, you would need to, um, once you have um, fit, uh, uh, an algo that fits, yeah, right? a good baseline. You have a good baseline. You can use 
um, automatic model tuning to find those values. And it may very well be that the, the optimal value is 11 with one layers and uh, and 162 epochs and whatever else, right? <laughs> yeah, those values tend to be completely weird anyway. Okay, so when we run this, okay, we run, we fit the estimator passing the location of data. Mm -hmm. uh, so we see all those steps, right? So maybe, uh, Sego, you can uh, explain what's going on here and uh, what, why SageMaker is, is again, uh, what, what SageMaker is doing now. Now, the idea is that uh, SageMaker girl is going, going to speak with the data uh, in the store into S3 and after um, so uh, SageMaker you don't have to um, to manage the infrastructure etc SageMaker is gonna um, do it for you mm -hmm. and um, yes after you take and after the training once you've got um, the, 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 the how do you say when the S3 talk with uh, SageMaker the connection, the, okay, sure. <laughs> the connection is, <laughs> is, is done. Um, after you're gonna uh, start the training um, again of your uh, CNN LSTM model on your data. Yeah, and you can see all those steps here, yeah, exactly. right? And they're done completely automatically. Yeah, exactly. Right? And again, if we wanted to do distributed training, uh, we would just say, hey, how about you train on 16 instances because I have a terabyte of data, right? And it's the only thing you need to do. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying it's one line of code, right? So even if I broke the line into multiple lines, it is really one line. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I'm not lying. Okay. So we're training. We see the training log. Uh, and that log is also available in uh, Amazon CloudWatch, which is our the monitoring service mm -hmm. for AWS. So of course, here we're running interactively in a notebook, but you could run this uh, headless uh, in a script or in a Lambda function or, in, or something different. And and you would still get your log in CloudWatch, mm -hmm. yeah? All right, so there's lots of output here. We can see the script being invoked. Ah, blue on blue is not gonna help. <laughs> uh, and this is why it's called script mode because this is really what how it runs, right? Mm -hmm. This is how SageMaker runs your code inside the MXNet container, right? Launching it just like you would mm -hmm. on your own machine, passing hyperparameters on the command line. Okay. Um, and now uh, we see, um, well, we see epochs, right? Going by. Yeah, epoch one. One, two, RMAC. three. And we see the RMAC. So we start at 30 something and it goes down, right? And uh, yeah, you have no sense of how fast this is running unless you look at this. Uh, it's about yeah, two seconds per epoch, mm -hmm. right? So this run for five, six minutes or something, mm -hmm. right? Very quickly. Okay. Uh, and that thanks to the GPU instance, I believe. And yeah, it goes down and I think we're getting to single digits, yes? <laughs> <laughs> Hope so, yes, we are, okay. <laughs> all right, all right, it goes up a little bit. Uh, we could we we did not configure early stopping and mm -hmm. and and patience and so on, but we could have done that. So anyway, we get to uh, you know single digit RMSC, which is okay, I guess. I'm sure we could do better, but again, probably we would need to tweak uh, parameters. So then the model is saved in S3, just like you said. Aha! Uh -huh. uh -huh. Now we oh, get, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and now we get to uh, the most profitable wow, three wow, lines wow. of code ever. My God. Uh, yeah, so we train for a little less than ten minutes, as you can see, total. But we're only built for one hundred and sixty-seven seconds, and that's a very sweet seventy point one percent discount, thanks to Spot, oh. right? So. This is really uh, a feature you want to use, right? Mm -hmm. It's called managed spot training. Again, all it takes is those parameters in the estimator. Okay, use spot instances equal true and set the maximum runtime for the job and set the maximum amount of time you want to wait for spot instances to be available. Okay. Most of the time you don't wait at all, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes there's a lot of demand and you may wait for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And But I'm happy to wait five minutes, right? If I got a 70% discount, I wish you could do the same at restaurants. <laughs> Yeah, wait 15 minutes and you get 70% discount, <laughs> right? That, that'd be, that, that's a great business idea. Okay, uh, whoops, let me go up to, okay, here we are. Okay, so we only get billed for 167 seconds. 
and we see all that stuff here and we could see all that stuff in the console as well mm -hmm. okay uh, we can see our training jobs yeah that's I think it's the one yeah all that information is also available there okay um so we have a model in s3 now we want to batch predict mm -hmm. okay so it's uh, again super simple just create a transformer object uh, with the instance type you want to use and uh, just run it right um, unleash that transformer object on uh, on the data stored in s3 Okay. And again, I think it's super important. It's very interesting that uh, thanks to SageMaker, just in one line of code, uh, mm -hmm. you can yeah. create uh, the transformer in order to do yeah. some inference later. Yep. And it's. Uh, yeah, if you wanted to deploy to a real time endpoint, yeah, we exactly. would call the deploy API. And again, it's one line of code. Well, so most operations are one line of code. It's a very uh, intuitive workflow mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's a, a reasonably simple SDK. I, I tell everybody you can learn it in a day. Right. I've, I've done some workshops, even four hours, and people are comfortable with it. Okay, and then we just process some data, transform it, and then we have transform data in S3, right? And we can view the results, okay? So we see fractional values here, mm -hmm. um, which are a little bit different to the uh, RUL thing that we had here. So can you explain maybe that part? confused me early on no 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 but uh, we just uh, normalize uh, the, the, the output you see the, you see it it's a normalized one so uh, you we should need uh, additional transformation mm. in order to uh, get the uh, pure actual um, format of the data but just at this moment you predict the rul um the, the rul is predicted uh, based on the training you've done Okay, so yeah, so it's the fractional value yeah, exactly. based on the a maximum value that is defined yeah, uh, exactly. somewhere else. Uh, you, you could probably predict this directly. Uh, mm -hmm. Here, it, they, they went for fractional values. And why not? That works. And then we're done, right? And uh, it's not a really big notebook. Uh, yeah, the, I think the SageMaker part is very simple. Yeah. Uh, literally uh, upload data in S3, use your estimator, and uh, and train and transform exactly and of course this lets you spend more time on understanding data and and writing your deep learning code mm -hmm. right? which is what you should be doing sage makers should not be standing in a way it should be very easy to use yeah, and exactly. and i think that's what it is and after uh, i think it's a um, cloud formation template you've got like some lambda and yes. Yeah, we said we said we'll talk yeah. about automation. So if you look at the re, in the repository, we have a, a lambda function in there that gets created automatically that is scheduled to periodically run batch uh, predictions. So yeah, you could uh, lambda and uh, another service called step functions yeah. let you build uh, serverless workflows, and they're a really really good fit with SageMaker. Yeah, when you um, want to put yeah, into yeah, maybe we'll explore this a little more in a, in a future episode. Cool. Uh, okay, that's the end of the demo. So we're really close to the to the end of the episode. If you have a, uh, uh, more questions, we have a few more minutes left. So ask them now. Uh, and um, so I think we can see predictive maintenance is quite powerful. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting <laughs> technique. Yeah, and, uh, and you don't rely on a crystal crystal box uh, bowl. When yeah, yeah, questions. which is great, especially especially if I'm on the plane. I don't want the pilot <laughs> to be using a crystal ball. <laughs> Um, I'll share a link uh, with you as well. We have a, another example of a predictive maintenance, actually in the aviation industry. Yeah. It's a session I, I was lucky to uh, to uh, to run at reInvent last year with uh, British Airways. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, they, they explain how they pull data off uh, their uh, airline fleet and uh, airplane fleet and, and process it and find uh, defaults before they can happen. So it's very cool. So I think it's time to wrap up. Okay, it's me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. So, I'll, I'll let me show the resources to our, <laughs> to our friends. So yeah, thank you uh, all to, 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 join, to join us. So today, uh, what we so, uh, we learned how to use uh, Amazon SageMaker to train and deploy a predictive maintenance model uh, implemented uh, with uh, Beyond and um, in order to predict uh, time series data. And uh, if you want, there is a lot 
euh, plenty more to learn uh, during this weekend and yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if, you, if you want more. Uh, so uh, please have a look at um, different uh, resources um, you can find uh, for related to this uh, episode. And if you have got some questions and feedback, please uh, don't hesitate to then send them to the Sage Marketer Fridays at amazon.com absolutely we were lucky we are looking forward to your feedback so plenty of resources here and um i have to mention uh, i published a book on SageMaker, and uh, you can buy a copy at a pretty sweet discount uh the paper edition is uh, is uh, discounted on amazon.com unfortunately it's only for the u.s uh, website but uh, anyone can order but it's only on amazon.com And if you're interested in uh, a nice discount on the ebook, then you can buy it from the editor website packet. And make sure to use the 20 SageMaker discount code and you're going to get 20%. This is only valid until November 11th. So don't wait for too long. Okay. <laughs> don't wait for too long. All right. Um, I think we're done and I think we're out of time. <laughs> right. As usual. <laughs> So <laughs> yes, we are very <laughs> excited about machine learning. We could keep going for days, right? So see you next week. See you next week. I hope you learned a lot. Uh, I, I did learn a lot. It's great to have Segolen and her expertise with us. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, again. Thank you to our uh, friendly moderators and experts answering questions. And next week we'll be live again from the Paris office, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, and we will talk about LSTMs again. LSTM yes, again. more LSTMs uh, with demand forecasting. And in future episodes, we'll talk about uh, all the topics, computer vision and natural language processing and fraud detection. We yeah, have a lot more, right? <laughs> so a fun. lot more. But okay, it's more than enough for today. So thanks again. Thanks to the AWS team for their support. Thank you for all the, all the people watching this film for your trust. And we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend. Learn a lot. See you on Friday. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Bye -bye. <laughs> <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs>